Okay, now uh, I will start a new subsection of the Laplace transform, which is called the unilateral Laplace transform. So what is this unilateral Laplace transform thing and what is the significance of it? Uh, the unilateral Laplace transform is by definition different from the previous Laplace transform, uh, which I simply said the Laplace transform. But if you want to specify the unilateral from the previous one, the previous one can be called the bilateral Laplace transform. Bi means two. Two-sided Laplace transform is uh, the bilateral Laplace transform. And over there, we had x of s equals from minus infinity to infinity, x of t e to the, uh, well, from minus infinity is a relatively bad expression for uh, the, the complex variable, but nevertheless, let's write it like that. Something like this. Uh, if it is from minus infinity to infinity, that is the bilateral uh, thing. The unilateral Laplace transform is like this. We can indicate it with a subscript of U, if you wish. Or uh, in the book by Oppenheim, it uses a more calligraphic X, like this, or something like this, which is a bit more pretty, if you wish. Uh, that one is, the new one is, from 0 to infinity, x of t, e to the minus s t dt. So the starting points in the, along the frequency, along the vertical frequency axis, is starting from a zero, uh, zero time. Um, and this zero time uh, omits some information. It omits the information about what has happened before time is equal to zero. If it is from minus infinity, it, it means uh, we don't need to find any initial conditions or anything. We don't need any initial conditions because uh, we know everything starting from minus infinity time. So everything that has accumulated into zero will form uh, the initial condition at t is equal to zero. But since uh, you know everything from minus infinity, you don't need that initial condition. But with this new explanation or new formula of zero to infinity at time is equal to zero, then uh, it means that you don't know what happened before zero. So you have to tell me what exactly the state of the system was. For example, if it's an uh, RLC circuit in the electrical circuitry, what was the initial charging uh, situation of the capacitor? What was the initial current flowing through the inductor? Those were the initial conditions. Okay? Those initial conditions are necessary in order to solve this unilateral Laplace transform expression. Uh, because they don't uh, have the information about what happened before, uh, what happened between minus infinity and zero. By the way, this zero minus term means that zero is included just in case of a discontinuity. Uh, a significant discontinuity at zero could be an impulse at zero. If there is an impulse at zero, zero minus uh, starting point means that you have to completely cover the impulse. You have to include the impulse. Starting from a little bit to the left of it and then towards right. So it includes the impulse. That's why it's a zero minus. Uh, now, what kind of a difference would it make First of all, notice that these two are these two expressions are precisely equivalent if x of t already starts at zero. So, if your signal is right-hand sided, totally right-hand sided, then they are the same. There is no difference between them. So, the unilateral and the bilateral Laplace transforms will give you the same solution. The difference will come into the picture if x of t has some portions at t is equal to minus values, the negative time uh, instances. So the first example um, will be like this. If x of t is equal to, let's say, some function alpha of t times u of t, and that u of t automatically forces the signal to start from zero, then 
I would say that uh, x of s is equal to x u of s. This will leave us with no ambiguity. However, for other types of signals, the situation will be different. For example, e to the minus a t plus 1, u of t plus 1. This is a <coughs> signal which starts where? It is again a right hand side signal, but it starts at minus 1. From minus 1 towards right hand side uh, is what we have here. First, let's, uh, let me briefly mention about what the uh, original bilateral, the previous Laplace transform of this signal was. It was x of s e to the uh, s plus s times 1, 1 over s plus 1. What does it mean? I mean, what trick did I use here? How come I easily wrote down the Laplace transform? What was the property that I used? Yeah, it's just plain time shifting. 1 over s plus 1 is e to the minus a t u t. And by shifting t to t plus 1, it means I must multiply the whole uh, Laplace transform by e to the s times the shift, 1. That's it. So do you agree that this is the Laplace transform? <coughs> because I didn't evaluate. Now I want to evaluate the unilateral Laplace transform this time. Because it's a, a little bit different. X u of s. And that is from 0 to infinity. And I don't uh, intend to write 0 minus anymore. Because there is no discontinuity at t is equal to 0. Um, e to the minus a t plus 1 u of t plus 1 e to the minus s t dt. Okay, this is just the definition. And this definition <coughs> will have the integral still starting from 0 to infinity and e to the minus a t plus 1 uh, e to the minus s t dt because u of t plus 1 already starts from minus infinity sorry, uh, mi minus 1 towards positive infinity, therefore uh, it's always 1 in this integral duration. I don't need to indicate it as u of t plus 1 or anything. Now let's reformulate this by combining the time terms <coughs> in the exponent. It's going to be like this, from 0 to infinity. e to the minus a, I will leave it isolated because we have an e to the minus a uh, times 1. And that is independent from the time. And the other time uh, terms can be combined into a minus t parentheses in the exponent as s plus a dt. And if the minus a can be taken out of the integral, the rest of the integral can be evaluated to be 1 over s plus a, which is the famous result that we have already obtained. And the overall thing is therefore e to the minus a. Well, let, let me write it like this. It will be minus, uh, sorry, e to the minus a times 1 over s plus a. Now, I'm glad that both of the results fit into the same uh, screen. One of them is at the very top, the other one is at the bottom. The previous answer was e to the s, 1 over s plus 1. Now, we have e to the minus a, 1 over s plus a. And that the, these two things are um, quite different. Excuse me, the, the, the first one is not S plus 1, it's S plus A. They are two different otherwise. It's not like that, excuse me about that. Of course, the pole of, uh, at the top one is uh, at minus A. So it is 1 over S plus A, which, is, which must be shifted. Excuse me about the confusion. The result is, the result of the previous one is E to the S. 1 over s plus a. Now it is e to the minus a. 1 over s plus a. And they are different, as you see. And the difference uh, becomes critical at positions uh, of uh, signals starting or occupying some range at negative times. But they are the same for 
some certain class of systems, and those class of systems are called causal systems. What is a causal system? A causal system has an impulse response, H of t, which uh, starts from zero and extends to positive time. So if you try to take the Laplace transform of causal systems, it doesn't matter which Laplace transform you take. It could be uh, the unilateral or the bilateral. They would give you the same. But for the others, they will be different. And this new unilateral Laplace transform will help us uh, to consider the, uh, how can we say, the, the initial condition of the system, uh, which we didn't care about previously. We didn't care about what the capacitor uh, current uh, charge value was, for example, for an RLC circuit. But now it can be handled, and it can be handled like this. First of all, we need to specify what uh, the time derivatives will correspond to in the new unilateral Laplace transform. Because the time derivatives will not be simply equal to S times X of S. It will be a little bit more than that. It will have to incorporate the initial values of the uh, overall signal or the system. Like this. D by DT, X of T, the first time derivative will have a unilateral Laplace transform equals S times X U of S. This much is expected, but it will also have the time signals value at zero minus. This is lowercase x, okay? It's like x of t. It's not the uppercase x. Uh, I'm not considering the Laplace transform there. It's the uh, initial value of x of t at t is equal to zero. That must appear inside your equation. And it goes on like that. I mean, if you take the second derivative, d squared by dt squared x of t, then its unilateral Laplace transform will have s squared capital X u of s, which is the expected one, but then you must subtract the time the derivative incorporation of the time initial value. So the top thing must be multiplied by s, in other words. And then you must subtract um, the time derivative initial value as well. Furthermore, do you, if you can follow this pattern, for example, can you tell me what d cubed divided by dt cubed x of t will have as a unilateral Laplace transform? It will have s cubed of x u of s minus can you follow? Let's uh, first of all you need to multiply the previous all of the previous with s. So you will have s square the uh, initial time value minus s the initial derivative value minus the second derivative's initial value as well. So the second time derivative. And it goes on like this. We can put some dots over there. This is how uh, you incorporate the initial values. So it's, it's a second order system. Uh, the initial va values, the first initial value at time is equal to zero will not be enough. You need to know the initial value of the derivative as well. In the circuit theory, what does that mean? I mean, how can you incorporate the initial values of that if it's an RLC circuit? which includes a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor. Normally, the uh, initial value, x of 0, would correspond to the charge value of the capacitor, but its second derivatives, uh, sorry, not second derivative, its derivatives initial value would correspond to uh, the current uh, initial value, which is the current initial value across the inductor. This time. So you need to know the initial value of the capacitor and the inductor because it's a second order system. You need to know two initial values in order to solve a circuit like that. 
But in general, if uh, the situation is even more complicated, you need to know more and more derivatives initial values. And those initial values will help us uh, solve the differential equations. Now, th this is how you were solving the differential equations in the course of differential equations. Let's remember that. Uh, the example is as follows. d squared by dt squared y of t plus 3d by dt y of t plus 2y of t is equal to x of t. <coughs> now, can somebody tell me how you solve this differential equation? The differential equation that uh, is required from you uh, contains two parts. Remember that? You have to solve it in two ways. In other words. The typical and homogeneous uh, solution. One of them this ho the homogeneous uh, solution, uh, what does that mean? What is the homogeneous uh, part of the solution? It corresponds to a, a no input case, zero input in other words. If x of t is zero, if there is no input coming into the system, that would give you uh, the uh, continuation of the system with their uh, initial values because the system already has some initial values. The capacitor is already charged. So it discharges, etc. It makes some oscillations in an RLC circuit, for instance. So it still works with some oscillations, decaying oscillations. That's a zero input case. And then there is uh, an input without any uh, initial conditions case, which is the particular solution. It assumes that there is no initial conditions and there's only input. When you combine the whole, when you combine the two, you will get the complete uh, solution of the differential equation with a specific input with, and with some specific initial conditions. That's how you should attack the question. Um, first of all, uh, the I will continue with something like this. I will assume that, um, let's write it like p uh, p part A, with zero initial conditions. With zero initial conditions, what is the situation? We will have HU of S, which is uh, H of S. Because if there is no initial condition, then the unilateral Laplace transform would correspond to a bilateral Laplace transform. They would mean the same thing. The only difference are, as you see, with the additional components here, or subtractional components, to be more precise. So that would be H of S, and the, uh, it is equal to 1 over S squared plus 3S plus 2. Can you see that? Just s squared plus 3s plus 2, and it's in the denominator. And this is h of s. Uh, the with zero initial conditions, and uh, I, mu I must, or I have to uh, assume a situation like this. I will say that x of t, the applied input for this one, is alpha times u of t, which is a unit step function that I, I'm going to apply. So the, uh, the combined solution requires the behavior of the system with no initial conditions, which I'm not taking now. I'm taking them to be uh, zero. And uh, this is the specific input. How does it behave? What is the time trajectory of y of t? So this is x of t, and therefore uh, x of s is equal to alpha over s, because the Laplace transform of u of t is 1 over s. And then, h of s times x of s will be equal to uh, y of s. And that will be equal to alpha over s, s plus 1, s plus 2. I can write it uh, as first order combinations because uh, clearly uh, the question is designed that way. 
S square plus 3 S plus 2 is equal to S plus 1 times S plus 2. It is designed to be an easy question like this. And when you separate them into first order systems, which uh, requires some effort, unfortunately, you find it as one of, uh, alpha over 2 over s minus alpha over s plus 1 plus alpha over 2 over s plus 2. Okay, I'm, I skipped a lot of steps again, unfortunately, to find the uh, numerator coefficients here. Uh, otherwise, it would require normally uh, three equations a, b, and c with three un uh, three unknowns a, b, and c with three equations. One of them would, would be the coefficient of s squared, which is zero. The other one would be the coefficient of s, which is still zero. The other one would be the coefficient of uh, scale itself, which is equal to alpha. And then you will have to solve for a, b, and c, and a will be this. B will be minus alpha, C will be alpha over 2. Okay, so that's something that I didn't do because that's not the point that I uh, want to indicate. So, uh, if we were solving this question without the, unilet uh, without the unilateral Laplace transform, without any initial conditions, we would immediately come up with the solution. This will be y of s and from there y of t is quite easy. It is equal to, in alpha parentheses, 1 over 2 minus e to the minus t plus 1 over 2 e to the minus 2t in parentheses u of t. Because the first alpha over 2 over s will be equal to alpha over 2 times u of t. 1 over s will have an inverse Laplace transform of u of t. Okay, Always keep in mind that one. Because that's a trivial example. And because of that, uh, we didn't see that example still, but we are using it constantly. This is the second time we are using the Laplace transform of u of t is 1 over s. So the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s is u of t. The others, first order systems, we know them. So that is y of t. What would be the, the case if, uh, so if that's part b, with conditions, initial conditions like y of 0 is equal to beta and its derivatives value at 0 is equal to gamma. Just two uh, parameters. Uh, let's try to incorporate them into the equations as well. And we, c we could do it like taking alpha is equal to 0 but is for the second order systems, things are not very much complicated. So let's solve it even with alpha. And the situation is like this. S squared y of s. Now, previously I said uh, where is it? Yeah, it's, it's from here. Um, Let's forget about this alpha over s parameter. Uh, we could write the equation like this. First, let me indicate that. y of s times s plus 1 times s plus 2 is equal to alpha over s times x of s. Okay, This was the original equation, in other words. Now, I am trying to write that equation again but uh, using the unilateral Laplace transform uh, and here it is s squared plus 3s plus 2 as you see so I need to find s squared times y of s that is what I'm writing now s squared times y of s but s squared times y of s uh, by itself will not be enough because it requires the second derivative in the original expression and the second derivative in the original expression requires two initial values of y. One of them is the initial value of y uh, at y 0 minus, at 0 in other words, 
times s. So s times y0 minus. And that y0 minus is beta. I have already given it here. And minus uh, 1 times y prime 0. And that is gamma. So that's it. Let's leave it like this. Instead of s square y of s by itself, now I need two more terms. Those are required by the initial conditions. I'm writing them over there. The other one is s times y of s, but it is, sorry, it is 3s times y of s. 3s y of s minus 3 times beta. That's coming from the initial condition for the first derivative. And plus 2 times y of s. Perhaps I should put u's here, y u of s, y u of s, and y u of s here. These are the unilateral Laplace transform I'm trying. And in the book, they again use some calligraphic y for the unilateral Laplace transform for, uh, to differentiate between the uppercase Laplace transform uh, letter y and the unilateral Laplace transform, but I cannot draw with calligraphy, so uh, I'm putting a subscript, a subscript of u. And that is equal to x of s. You can take it as 0 and solve, uh, but now I, I'm not going to uh, find uh, the homogeneous solution. I'm going to find the ho whole solution all at once. If you take the right-hand side uh, is equal to 0, you will find the homogeneous part. But uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to put the input as well. It's equal to alpha over s, x of, x of s in other words. And by combining everything, you will find y u of s to be equal to beta times s plus 3 divided by s plus 1. I should write it more condensed. Excuse me about that. Uh, do, don't erase. I'm going to write the same thing, but smaller. S plus 3 divided by S plus 1. S plus 2. Plus gamma over S plus 1. S plus 2. Plus alpha over s times s plus 1, s plus 2. Now let's look at this whole solution. This is including uh, the homogeneous part and the particular solution. Do you recall where the homogeneous, uh, where, where the particular solution is? Here. What was it previously? was in the box. Unfortunately, a little bit distorted, but it's in the box. Alpha over s, s plus 1, s plus 2. Can you see it here? It's the last term here. Alpha over s, s plus 1, s plus 2. That last term is the um, particular solution. Or uh, zero state response. The others require two parameters, beta and gamma. And if they are zero, by the way, if you take beta is zero, gamma is zero, the first two terms are uh, completely vanished. They go away, and we are left with a particular solution or the zero state response, because the states, beta and gamma, are zero. However, if you take alpha to be equal to zero, which is the zero input response, the rest will be equal to the homogeneous part. Or the zero input response. There's no input. Alpha is zero. We don't have anything from here. We only have uh, the zero input homogeneous part, that's the behavior of the system without any perturbation from the outside. It 
gets perturbed only uh, with its intrinsic dynamics. The initial values will be enough to move the system with the first two terms. Uh, this example was designed with some certain very nice parameters and those parameters are like this. In an example, if you say alpha is equal to 2, beta is equal to 3, and gamma is equal to minus 5, then magically value of s may be split into uh, a third order system very easily like this 1 over s minus 1 over s plus 1 plus 3 over s plus 2 which makes y of t to be equal to 1 minus e to the minus t min plus 3 e to the minus 2 t u of t so a very simple uh, solution can be achieved with this, with this selection of alpha, beta, and gamma. Uh, unfortunately, life may not be as simple as this one because uh, the, those alpha, beta, gamma parameters are very deliberately uh, chosen to simplify the whole expression into a very simple three. Uh, it's a combination of three first order systems like this. But it's just one example, as you see. So what can you expect from the um, unilateral Laplace transform in the uh, final? Uh, I, I'm not going to continue with any further uh, concepts, any further topics, because we will have to start with the, with the new chapter, which is the Z transform. Uh, but for the time being, uh, uh, let's discuss about what sort of questions may appear. The questions that you may expect in the final could be nothing or <laughs> so it's not much of an information it may be nothing because um, the Laplace transform itself uh, will have a lot of questions there's a lot of variety in the uh, Laplace transform including feedbacks how can you stabilize the system so we have a lot of questions if those questions will be too much for the final I may omit any questions from here but if I intend to ask one question regarding the unilateral Laplace transform, it could be a simpler version of a differential equation like this. Okay. And I may ask you to separate the zero input and the zero state responses. Clearly identify which part is a zero input and which part is a zero state response. It could be like this. And hopefully simpler than this one. This is a third order uh, thing, a second order system with exponential perturbation. Uh, so it would be like first or second order, maybe, or it can be the evaluation of a particular unilateral Laplace transform, like this. Like this. And I may ask you to compare with the it with the uh, bilateral original Laplace transform and see the difference. It could be like that, a simple, single Laplace transform. Uh, by the way, the top one requires a region of convergence. The normal bilateral Laplace transform requires a region of convergence. But the unilateral Laplace transform, this one, doesn't require a region of convergence because it is always to the right of zero. Okay. That's why perhaps you have never encountered the region of convergence concept in uh, differential equations because the Laplace transform that you use in differential equations was the unilateral Laplace transform, the bottom one. And it helps uh, us solving questions with initial conditions like this. So every rose has its storm. If you are happy with the initial conditions, then use it that way. Use the uh, unilateral Laplace transform and try to solve your questions this way. But if you are better happy with region of convergence concepts, then go to the uh, bilateral, the original Laplace transform, 
and use the additional knowledge or information of region of convergence. It's up to you in uh, the original, in the real uh, engineering life, I mean. You can use in either way to solve your problems. So that's all about uh, the Laplace transform business. We will continue with the Z transform now, which is the counterpart of Laplace transform in discrete time. Okay. As opposed to the discrete time Fourier transform, we will have some real part of the discrete time Fourier transform. And with that real part, everything will be notated as the so-called Z transform. And that will be the last topic that we will cover in this semester. Okay. So in questions? Okay then, see you tomorrow. We stop at this point.